Good afternoon. On behalf of the True Last College of Business and our partners at MU Extension and Engagement, welcome to this inaugural offering of the True Last Business Insider Series. My name is Ajay Vinze, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Dean of the Robert J. True Last Senior College of Business. Today's session is moderated by Professor Anthony Ross. Professor Ross is a member of our management faculty and is a nationally known scholar in the area of supply chain management. Today's session features a distinguished group of panelists who will focus on the riding the roller coaster of disrupted supply chains in Missouri. So without further ado, I would like to turn the session over to Professor Anthony Ross. Well, thank you, Dean Vinze, and welcome to all of you who are present with us this morning for today's Business Insider webinar, our focus, supply chain management. You know, in today's business, Winning a customer order, accessing a new market, launching a new product. These are no longer enough uh, to endure and survive in the long term. For both service and manufacturing companies must constantly prepare, detect, and respond to opportunities for repeat wins in their respective marketplaces. But opportunities for repeat wins in their respective markets don't come easy. And it's much more than that. Read any print and online news source on any given day of the week, and supply chain management is mentioned more so today as a source of competitive advantage than ever before. A recent study analyzing the annual reports of S&P traded companies found that in 2015, these companies' annual reports discussed supply chain management topics at a rate double of that just 10 years prior. So what is supply chain management? Why is it important for our state? More importantly, what has happened to and in our state over the last six months? To shed light on this and other related questions impacting Missouri, we are delighted to welcome a distinguished panel of executive leaders addressing this topic. I am delighted to introduce to you Commissioner Zora Mulligan, who serves with the Missouri Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development, Jackie Rasmussen, who is the president of NASBITE International and program manager at the University of Missouri MU uh, IT International Trade Center. And Mr. Scott Stuckenschneider, he's the vice president of supply chain North America for Hudamaki in Kansas City. So with that, let's begin. But first some overview in terms of our layout for today's session. The webinar will flow as a series of rounds where I ask the panelists some thought-provoking questions, uh, really as laying the groundwork to in, engage you at the end of our session where we will have a question and answer. We will moderate the chat box with your questions as they come in. So please feel free to enter your questions as we begin and, and flow through our session today. <clears throat> And without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into our, our session today. All right. We will have this first question thrown to Commissioner Mulligan, and then with a chance for Scott Stuckenschneider, Stuckenschneider and then Jackie Rasmussen to respond as well. So let's begin with our first question. I'd like to have each of the panelists tell us, if you will, um, more about your organization, and in particular, how the topic or profession of supply chain management matters from your vantage point. So Commissioner Mulligan, I'll start with you. Very good, I'm pleased to start. Good afternoon all, I'm Zora Mulligan. Uh, I work for an organization called the Coordinating Board for Higher Education, which was really established um, around an idea loosely connected to supply and demand and supply chain management. And again, I'll just say up front that I have about a fourth graders understanding of supply chain management. Uh, but the Coordinating Board for Higher Education was really established um, when higher education institutions proliferated uh, and became more uh, sophisticated and more uh, competitive in terms of funding from the state in the 1960s and 1970s. And so the Coordinating Board was really established on the idea that some central uh, coordinating body, not political, uh, needed to have a voice in you know, where we need additional higher education institutions, the levels at which those should be funded, the programs that each offers, 
And so again, kind of loosely, where our DNA is about this idea of supply and demand management. Um, who we are today, uh, our, our primary um, activities are around setting policy, uh, convening, informing, and funding. Uh, and in those areas, we also have a very strong role in terms of workforce development. And so thinking about, um, you know, if you think about um, students in a, in a manufacturing analogy, which a lot of people hate, but it's still very common, you know, thinking about students as the raw material located all around the state, getting them through the manufacturing process, which might be analogous to training, and then coming out the other end. Uh, you know, we think about these issues all the time, and so it's a really fundamental part of our work. Wonderful. Thank you. You know, in, in speaking of workforce development, we have about nearly 5,000 small to medium-sized enterprises in Wisconsin. And we'd be curious to know later in the session when we come back to the topic, what your thoughts are around the workforce of today and tomorrow from a talent development, talent pool, upskilling perspective. So we'll come back to that. Okay, uh, Mr. Stuckenschneider, Scott. Thank you, Anthony, and uh, thank you, Dean Venze, for uh, the opportunity to be with you all today. Uh, I represent a company called Hudamaki. Uh, Hudamaki is a uh, $3 billion global packaging uh, manufacturing company. We are headquartered in uh, Espo, Finland, and our North American headquarters are in a suburb of, uh, of Kansas City. Uh, North America represents about $1.3 billion uh, of our global enterprise. We have uh, three market-facing businesses that uh, may be more familiar to those that uh, are attending today's webinar and uh, those would include our consumer goods business which you might uh, know more as an ice cream packaging business so we make uh, packages for ben and jerry's and haagen dazs and uh, many of the, the local uh, or regional dairies uh, around the uh, the u.s we also have a uh, retail business facing unit that uh, would probably be known best as the Chinette uh, brand of uh, fiber, molded fiber paper plates. And then we also have a food service business unit, which uh, services the food service outlets, quick serve restaurants such as Arby's, Wendy's, Chipotle, Popeye's, those types of uh, things. We go to business in, uh, in three technologies. So we have a paper converting uh, business, we have a plastics uh, converting business, and then we have a molded fiber technology. So those are the, uh, those are the three uh, business uh, technologies that we have. I lead our supply chain uh, team. We have a centralized supply chain team in North America, and that's here in Kansas City. Uh, we define our supply chain as our planning and inventory management group, our logistics group, which would be transportation and warehousing, our sourcing group, which uh, purchases all of our raw commodities, and then we also add our customer service team into supply chain because usually where they go to solve their problems is to the supply chain. So uh, that's the reason we have elected to do that. Uh, why supply chain is important is that it represents about 70% of the cost uh, of our material and or of our, of our product that we're selling to our customers. So it obviously has a very big impact on uh, the products that we sell to our customers. Wonderful. And Scott, if I may follow with a short question, can you comment briefly on uh, product design uh, interactions that you have with your customers on designing uh, the, 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 the packaging material? Sure. Uh, our product design is, uh, is handled primarily by our engineering uh, team, which is also uh, just around the corner from our, our supply chain. And they, they respond to our customers' needs uh, uh, you know, there are lots of different reasons that we have uh, product redesign. People want to downsize the package from a 64-ounce ice cream container to a 48-ounce ice cream container, or they want to upsize from a medium fry to a jumbo extra large fry for uh, an extra value meal or something along those lines. So, so we get lots of requests on a, on a daily basis for uh, ideas of how we can redesign packaging, uh, sustainably taking product or taking material out of the package, doing more with less on a regular basis. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come back uh, a little bit later and maybe, maybe uh, ping you a little bit. Looks like we might have lost Anthony there just for a little bit. So I know I was next on the list as far as introductions go. So let me um, proceed there and then hopefully we can reconnect with um, Anthony. 
but my name is Jackie Rasmussen, and um, in my capacity on today's panel, um, I'm uh, representing, I currently have the honor of serving as the president of NASBITE International. Uh, NASBITE International is a membership-based professional association uh, comprised of educators, trainers, uh, service providers and international trade practitioners whose mission it is uh, to advance global business practice education and training. Uh, NASBITE International also manages the Certified Global Business Professional Credential uh, and so that um, CGBP designation uh, confirms knowledge in um, kind of four domains of international trade, marketing, management, supply chain, and trade finance. And it serves as a, um, I guess, an endorsement of sorts that individuals that hold that credential are um, knowledgeable and um, have the professional know-how um, to be able to compete and, and provide good service in today's um, trade environment. Uh, I also serve as the um, program manager for the uh, MU International Trade Center, which is housed within the Trulass College of Business. And uh, in the five years that the International Trade Center has been operating, our focus has been on um, providing uh, customized global market research uh, services for small to medium sized uh, companies right across the state of Missouri that are interested in expanding their uh, international uh, trade footprint um, internationally. And so we work with those companies to help them with market identification and market evaluation activities so that they, um, they have information to support uh, decision making and business expansion. Uh, those projects are completed with the assistance of undergraduate students that intern with the International Trade Center uh, each semester. And so um, we are able to meet the needs of those companies, the information needs of those companies, but also provide those students with a hands-on experiential learning opportunity where they're interacting with the company uh, representatives. They are involved in doing the data analysis and the um, market research that supports um, the project work that we're doing. And then they are responsible for the deliverables, a mid-project and a final project report and presentations that are delivered um, to those companies and so with those efforts we've had the opportunity to work with about 70 or so small and medium-sized companies right across the state um, over the past five years and so um, in that capacity we get to um, get some insight into the business operations um, the challenges that those companies are facing and um, all of the components that work together into um, supporting their needs as they expand their businesses internationally. I think Anthony might still be frozen. If you guys don't mind, I can go ahead with the questions which are in front of me, if that's okay. Anthony, when you're ready, uh, just go ahead and take over. All right, it looks like I got bumped out, but immediately reconnected again. Thank you're you, back. Jackie. I did catch most of your comments here. Let's move on to um, our, our next question. We've heard different vantage points of supply chain management from a traditional supply uh, manufacturing perspective for a goods producing company. Zor gave us a nice overview from a public service organization, uh, that is, it is a, is a government organization that is a service to the state. Uh, and then Jackie talked about supply chain from the standpoint of what do we do as an institution of higher education in developing talent and also for a role uh, in uh, the NSBIT in terms of providing professional certifications for those interested in global trade. I think that sounds close enough. Uh, if you'll uh, give me some leeway, my panel. So, so supply chain management, it's really, if we put these comments together, it, it, it really is a network of businesses and inter and intra company relationships, uh, whether it be engineering or marketing or sales and finance, uh, focused on coordinating the key processes of planning, sourcing, producing and delivering products, right, and services to customers in a way that, that, that delivers value. Um, and, and so we've seen in our profession here over the last few years, significant disruptions uh, on a, a local, regional, national, and now global scale. In 2017, we had hurricanes Harvey and Irma that disrupted the transportation sector throughout the Northeast. The ripple effect of that was mismatched transportation drivers and transportation assets that were misplaced to be able to move goods down the long, the, the, along this last mile of the supply chain. 
uh, in the oil and gas sector, what we're seeing today, today is significant advances in the cost of uh, oil and gas exploration and production to the point where now we've got an onslaught of a glut of petroleum-based uh, fuel in the United States, which keeps our prices relatively low, but there are significant global implications for, 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 for that phenomenon as well. And, and then lastly, you know, today as of mid-2020, we see an ongoing global trade uh, tensions impacting several sectors. Uh, we're seeing rising transportation costs, uh, particularly because of the parcel delivery, because of the stay-at-home economy. Most of us are staying at home and ordering out and doing our regular shopping uh, and having those, those products delivered to our door. Right. And so uh, we're seeing a global economic shutdown that was felt not just in a region of the United States, not felt just in manufacturing plants, but felt everywhere, shipping ports, uh, logistics companies, retailers, in our homes. Uh, and so we're now seeing a, also seeing a phased reopening um, of uh, the economy, uh, but it too is complicated by potential second wave uh, or second waves of uh, COVID's uh, return and, and outbreaks. So given all of these current realities, right, I, I think it asks us to think about uh, our next question, right? And I wanna ask our panelists um, in, in this context, what do you see, what do you hear, uh, what do you sense happening today in, in, in your particular context um, relative to the talent pool of Missouri in a COVID disrupted economy? Um, is, there a, uh, is there a talent pool there for, for, for your particular constituents or your customers to draw upon? Uh, and what, where are the gaps? Uh, and maybe what help is needed? So I want to throw a, 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 a potpourri of questions out there and then ask our, our panelists to plug and play and jump in where you see uh, needed. Let's start with Scott on this question. Thanks, Anthony. I think that uh, from Hudamaki's perspective, uh, we, would, uh, we would probably say that uh, uh, supply chain is a, a new development in the, in the manufacturing business. Uh, 15 years ago, we didn't have a supply chain. We had a bunch of different functions within our, uh, within our company, uh, all being done individually by, by plants at different locations. And uh, so we joined the supply chain game perhaps 15 years ago, and it has continued to evolve over a period of time. Uh, one of the things that has occurred is, is that uh, uh, different schools have begun to offer supply chain management as an area of emphasis. And we at Hudamaki have used that as a, a uh, place for us to partner with universities such as Missouri and other area institutions where we have the opportunity to draw the best and the brightest out of those, out of those schools. Uh, we call that uh, our career program, and we have that both in a commercial sense, but we also have it in a supply chain sense where we bring students in that have the academic background uh, and exposure into supply chain and into business and we try to teach them the elements of the business from the from the ground up uh, the second part of your question is what uh, what do we find that uh, might not uh, uh, be up to par or is lacking in uh, in, in those uh, people that uh, that we find and uh, what we're finding today is is that uh, data analytics becomes more and more important uh, every day and we find that the uh, Certainly the young people and the students that, uh, that we recruit have tremendous data analytic capability. And when I say that, I say that a little bit tongue in cheek because they have tremendous ability to create large amounts of data. Uh, what's lacking is teaching people how to create actionable uh, actions to take so that uh, we can act upon the data that they, they provide. And so that is something that when we get into the classroom and when we uh, get exposure to the students that we're trying to emphasize, don't bring us the data, bring us the action that we should take as a result of the data. Sure, absolutely. You know, I'm gonna pivot here real quickly because I see Zora shaking her head and she's jumping at the bit to get in here. So Jackie, if you'll forgive me, let's go to Zora and then come back to Jackie. 
Sure. So I thought about this question in two ways, and I'll answer the one that pertains to my everyday job in state government. You know, I mean, we obviously spend a lot of time thinking about what competencies students should have when they graduate from different academic programs. But we're also acting as lead leaders of large organizations within, you know, the biggest employer in the state of Missouri, which is the state government. Uh, I will say, um, you know, most of us who lead state departments were hired because we have expertise in the content area over which we um, work and very little expertise in terms of supply chain management or the other kind of business school basics. Uh, the PARSA administration has made um, management a really important part of the job of being a department director. It shouldn't be the case that that's new, but it certainly has been. So, you know, since March 13th, my job has been, um, you know, working with colleagues around state government on the, you know, kind of four main pillars that the governor has organized, testing, PPE, hospital bed capacity, predictive analytics, and, and I was nodding because predictive analytics is so important. Um, most of those really, I mean, the, the, certainly the top two testing and PPE are largely supply chain issues. And so just figuring out, you know, what is the state's role? What can we do to help you know, early on in this? We were seeing um, you know, organizations within state government bidding against each other, states bidding against each other, private companies involved. And so again, trying to think about what the state's appropriate role is. Um, as we you know, partner with our colleges and universities to prepare for a safe reopen of campus in the fall, uh, supply chain is also going to be a really important part here because it's going to require testing um, along uh, the lines of a magnitude that um, the, the state has never seen before, testing for COVID-19. So it is a major part of everything that I do uh, and every part of my job. So, it, but yes, yeah, so we swim daily in seas of information with um, sometimes limited insight as to what it means. Okay, wonderful. Jackie? Sure. So um, if we take a look at, you know, um, the impact of um, supply chain disruption on um, companies um, like Scott's company and small and medium sized companies right across the state, um, you know, kind of feedback that I'm hearing from the clients that we're uh, working with is that, um, you know, uh, companies are looking to uh, realign or restructure their supply chains based upon um, the events that have happened um, and the disruption and, um, you know, potential depletion of inventory supplies that they had um, during times of um, closure or, um, you know, um, difficulties in getting supplies to them. Um, so um, we, as companies look to strategically position themselves to um, be, um, I guess, um, to mitigate risks um, longer term, um, they're engaged in activities that can help them in um, reviewing their supplier network, uh, potentially um, shifting suppliers, looking to diversify the suppliers that they have um, in place. Those are all longer term strategies um, that, you know, take time to pull um, the pieces together. Um, but the, the goal is there that with that diversification that they, they um, can, um, as I said, mitigate those risks and not necessarily be subject if it is internally or internationally that there is disruption, whether that be through um, health related concerns or trade relations or tariff policies, uh, etc. Uh, related to that, I think, and maybe um, potentially a little bit of a, sh um, a sh um, shorter term um, solution for companies is that they're also uh, reevaluating what their inventory levels should be or what type of safety um, stock that they need to have on hand and where that inventory is placed, um, whether that be. Um, so I think there is a, a lot of um, questions going on within companies to take a look at. Um, should they be near sourcing um, their in inventory so that there is a, a shorter supply chain um, um, to provide bringing products um, to them? Um, can they put place inventory in a variety of different locations so that if there is disruption um, in one location that they have um, alternatives to be able to um, source product um, from? And I also think, you know, that they're also, as part of that near sourcing, when you take a look at other items in the news, the, the renegotiation of the NAFTA contract and the USMCA, I think there will be increasingly US companies that are looking to take a look at how can I take advantage um, of, um, are there any, um, you know, kind of changes there or more advantageous um, options 
Uh, and also looking within the state to take a look at if, if I'm a manufacturing entity and we have foreign trade zones, um, here are their advantages that I can um, take um, to take a look at um, you know, minimizing costs if I am looking at uh, importing products and then turning around and exporting those um, products moving out. I'm also, um, you know, talking with some of the clients that we've worked with, you know, they're getting inquiries just um, from um, companies that are um, potentially, a, again, a longer term strategy, looking after they outsourced um, product offshore um, to take a look at bringing some of those important production activities um, inside um, the company's operations. So that's a longer term capital investment strategy that they might be making. Um, but there is, you know, definitely um, emotional decisions that are being made that, you know, with um, trade, you know, with the, um, the balance of trade between uh, China and reliance on China and looking to, um, you know, um, not necessarily sever those ties, but also along the line of diversification to provide their companies with um, increased um, options. And I think, you know, um, the other thing just finally that I would say from a, you know, kind of a little bit more global perspective from supply chain, I think it, um, the activities, you know, with COVID and supply chain disruption for small and medium sized companies and even um, larger operations, I think um, it's caused those companies to reevaluate and to reassess the, the relationships that they have in place. As particularly with shipping companies or freight forwarders or those types of things to take a look at that they've got a good partner um, with them in business there that it may not necessarily be the low cost provider that um, for an individual shipment but they've got someone that has um, the network um, and the connections in place that when there are disruptions whether that be um, you know, a, um, at, at a single port or um, a change in a business policy or those types of things that they've got a, um, a, a I guess, a, a partner that has um, expertise that can help them in handling that situation um, effectively and efficiently. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, but I was going to circle back. You asked about talent Please. pool particularly, and I was just going to respond to that. Yes. Um, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, clearly there is a universe of professionals who focus on supply chain management, and that is, is really essential. But I think, you know, this experience and the experiences of the future suggest that there really are opportunities to educate a much broader group of people um, with a certificate program or a short-term training program, you know, so I can think of like 10 majors at Mizzou where it, it would be beneficial for people to have exposure to supply chain management and other kind of business school basics. Um, you know, uh, data analytics is another one where, um, you know, it's, we're no longer allowed to be specialists and we really have to understand how the world around us works um, and yes. our role within it. So I, I think there is a tremendous opportunity for, um, for increase. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and Zora, if you would hold that thought for just a minute, because I want to come back to you for round three to kick us off, because you, you open the door to a very important point. So, so what we've heard so far here in, in, in this second phase or round is really the importance of, uh, or the potential value of uh, partnering with universities in your, in your, in your, in your state or in your region um, uh, to help prepare uh, students who are ready to hit the road or hit the ground running in a particular organization from day one. Uh, and, and the way that companies do that through partnerships is quite like you know, Jackie described in terms of real world projects and engagement that, that really showed students that you know, the data is not always on page two in table 1.3 and well organized. Uh, and so how do you get the ground running being comfortable in functioning in a poorly structured or unstructured real world problem environment? Right. I think Jackie eloquently, you know, highlighted those those particular issues. Um, I, I think the role of analytics, as you and Scott um, have have, uh, have accurately described, as a real need for talent to not be afraid to get into uh, this messy data and help help people like you, your, your executives, figure this out in terms of decision making. Um, but what that opens up the, the, the door to, Zora, coming back to you now, is we haven't talked about the two year institutions within the state. And if you can talk a little bit about how the two-year institutions as a source to help those without a four-year degree upskill uh, as, as supply chain um, 
the supply chain profession matures here in our state or begins to take off as both Jackie and Scott have, have alluded to. Could you segue us into round three with, with a reaction to that question or comment? I definitely can. So I think part of the reason I was invited to participate in this conversation is Anthony knows I have a cousin who started out in supply chain management at a community college and went on to Michigan State University is now as a graduate student who spends a lot of time thinking about packaging. So Scott, you might have a friend and my cousin. Um, you know, yes. So community colleges have a great deal of strength in manufacturing in particular, and those are often programs that are operated in very close partnership with um, employers, with a cluster of employers. And so if you think about a manufacturing curriculum as not only including, you know, the nuts and bolts of how to use your hands to make the pieces, but also the mental work that will prepare people for um, progressing into management positions, there is a huge and really obvious um, opportunity there. Another opportunity with community colleges is just by nature, they tend to be um, sh you know, short term. And so to you know, reach a group of people who might not have the time to dedicate to a longer term program. And so thinking about shorter term credentials um, that adults, uh, and particularly now as we look about out of work adults, uh, that they might be able to participate in, in short order to um, gain strength in a skill that is suddenly you know, in the highest demand. Um, another reality is uh, a lot of our state and federal funding is, is organized around short-term training programs. So obviously, in the higher education universe, there's the Pell Grant and a lot of loan programs and state student financial aid. Uh, but there is also a lot of aid that's available specifically to people who are going to attend community colleges to focus on, on particular skills. So I would say, you know, the, the people are there, you know, even though unemployment uh, numbers in Missouri have begun to improve somewhat. The raw material is very much there. You know, the financial resources are there, which is something we can't say very often in the higher education universe. And the demand is there. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity to work in partnership with community colleges. Again, many of which already have um, close relationships with the employers that are also participating in the supply chain universe uh, to begin to think about building up that curriculum. Okay, okay. Uh, and, and then as we move here into round, round three, we talked about, you know, this focus on uh, the ways in which the COVID environment and social distances, is in, social distance requirements or expectations is impacting companies, both public and, and private. Um, so, Scott, can I ask you to lead us off with that response and then we'll go to back to Zora and then to Jackie around what you see as social distancing impacting large and small companies uh, from your vantage points? Sure, I think that uh, that you know certainly COVID has had a dramatic impact on uh, not only Hudamaki but on on America in general. And I think when you think about the the different uh, sequences that have taken place in uh, in late February, early March, you had the panic buying that took place, and so that resulted in inventory depletion. So then companies and their supply chains had to okay, how are we going to rebuild this? Uh, inventory and should we rebuild this in inventory because we knew we were going to be coming in for a downturn and exactly that occurred. A, a dramatic downshift uh, during the month of April occurred in most businesses as we went into you know the lockdown uh, environment and you know then when do you expect it's going to return? How do you how do you start building things up and most companies that uh, when the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, lockdown began became a preservation of cash was the most important thing that a company could do. So you didn't want to have your cash tied up in raw material that you didn't know when you were going to use it. You didn't want to have it tied up in inventory. And you certainly monitored exactly who you were shipping to and when you were shipping to, to, to have yourself positioned uh, properly as you go through the process. So, you know, all of those things have had tremendous impacts on, on our company and on the supply chain. You know, you asked the question about, uh, about social distancing and, and the impact that, uh, that that has. And I would tell you that, you know, we're able to find ways to keep our people apart. We've obviously kept uh, our non-essential people out of the manufacturing area, but we've, we've been able to spread our, our work groups apart to, to, to be able to, uh, to practice good social distancing uh, practices. The hard part is, is when you go through the, the slowdown, which occurred during the month of April, then you have to bring those people back to work. And it's bringing them back to work when 
you know, at the lower ends of the, the manufacturing process, you know, the unemployment and the additional government benefits and subsidies that were occurring really make it where people are starting to ask themselves, well, should I stay at home or should I go back to work? And so, you know, getting your people back to work when, as you're going through this process has been a very important element of, you know, us uh, gearing back up to, uh, to supply our customer base. Sure, sure. And, and Jackie, you're in that small to medium sized enterprise space here. Um, and, you know, ramping back up, uh, they're more susceptible or vulnerable to sudden sh- shutdowns in global trade or importing and exporting. Tell us what, you're, what, you, what you think might be happening or going on there. Yeah, sure. And I think, um, you know, the impacts of um, this whole um, um, pandemic, you know, there, there have been impacts that have been um, universally felt. And then I think there are impacts that have been um, greater or lesser based upon the industry um, sector that, you were, that you're in. I've, you know, I've um, spoke with a, um, a client that, you know, is a, a small and medium sized company that, that, you know, they closed their operations in that late March, early April period. Um, but they have a, pro- a consumer product line that is um, targeted at, at hobbyists. And so their sales in um, May and June, they've actually had record sales, um, you know, domestically and internationally based upon because people had limited options in what they were doing. And so, you know, um, positively for their business, um, you know, that that's, um, there has been, um, you know, kind of um, sales have increased. Um, and in conjunction with that, they're, they're you know, looking to um, increase employment, uh, but, you know, there sometimes is a little bit of a lag in being able to bring um, people on board um, to do that. I also think, you know, um, just as, a, you know, um, part of the, the social distancing has um, impacted and Scott and, and Zora would, will agree that I think, you know, communications and the use of technology has um, changed, you know, for a lot of businesses, um, at, um, especially domestically and internationally, depending uh, attending trade shows and um, mass marketing events is where a lot of um, you know business is done and sales um, prospects are generated. And so you know even looking um, to the extended future, those large events are um, you know have been cancelled or postponed or and pushed off until next year. And so from a from a sales perspective. Um, uh, you know, companies are, are looking to reconnect with customers in a, in a different way. And, you know, the, the medium that we're using this morning to connect has, has been um, worked well and kind of probably been a lifesaver for a lot of companies. Um, you know, but in the, on the international um, environment where that relationship compo- component to sales um, can be significant, I think there's been, you know, I, I, maybe the, there is some po- long-term positives that maybe – you know, traveling face to face and making those connections and that type of thing. There may be some shifts there that people realize that um, I can still connect. I can make eye contact um, with uh, someone across the distance, uh, and I may be able to effectively um, build a relationship and make um, connections um, that way uh, longer term. Um, so I think um, you know. I think there is, um, as I said, some. There is there are definitely challenges that have been um, viewed long term. Um, mm. You know, people most definitely are looking at um, diversification of suppliers or reevaluating what that mix um, should be. Um, you know, so that they are um, better prepared, and and those are those aren't short term um, fixes for either a small or a large company. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, in two thousand thirteen. Uh, Yahoo CEO uh, Melissa Meyer uh, uh, publicly announced that uh, the company will not uh, support or engage with telecommuting in the workplace. And here we are now, just seven years later, and of necessity, uh, telecommuting, uh, a remote working, remote distance working, uh, is vastly becoming part of the new norm. And there are many, I I think you all would agree with me, there there are probably long-term behavioral uh, or emotional workplace satisfaction uh, issues, unintended 
uh, of course, that may present themselves on both sides of the coin. Those who enjoy staying at home and telecommuting and those who, who, who don't enjoy it and would rather be in that space connecting to people. Uh, and particularly, if you think about Scott, you know, a large manufacturing company, the frontline employees versus the staff, right? Two different, you know, cultural orientations potentially and needs around and impacts around this workplace uh, of today, so to speak. So thank you for your comments. Very, very, very uh, insightful. Okay, so it is now about 1240 here. I think we uh, might um, take a pivot here and check with our participants for a Q&A and let this, uh, let this guide us uh, uh, down to our closing here. So let's open it up. Uh, I will check the Q&A box here for questions. All right, we have one from uh, Professor Varum uh, Arunachalam. Thanks to all of you uh, for the presentation. Uh, I had a general question related to supply chain management from an accounting perspective. So now we're thinking about the finance and accounting uh, linkages uh, alluded to in term by Scott in terms of performance. Uh, so if it's not too far off your focus, um, why the fragility of supply chains uh, exposed during this pandemic? Do you have incoming data on corporate rethinking of inventories, specifically the way they view holding and carrying costs, uh, spoilage, uh, uh, and I would also link that, Scott, to OS&D, overage, shortage, and damage in the warehouse, insurance, uh, local sourcing, and mentioned by Jackie, uh, and consequently for how we teach these concepts, accounting, finance, management, et cetera. So I hear some cross-functional linkages um, from supply chain to marketing, supply chain to finance and, and accounting, and perhaps even to information technology. Scott, let's start with you. There's a lot to unpack in that uh, in that question, that uh, as you can imagine. But uh, well, how I about you procure to pay? You know, that's that's linked to costs and finance. Sure, I I, I would tell you that uh, from an accounting standpoint. Uh, We've had some uh, very specific actions that uh, that we've taken uh, as it results to our inventory planning, as it results uh, in our collections, um, and you know, and just our, our credit holds and and those types of things in general. Uh, pretty much when uh, when COVID started, we we went into you know, and we're a very healthy, strong company, but uh, you know, we did not want to increase our exposure because we knew companies were not going to uh, come out of this on the backside, and we didn't want to be uh, be there uh, having to hold the bag with a, a lot of credit to people who weren't strong enough to survive. So. You know that became a, a very strong point where our accounting department uh, and our finance department created all kinds of tools for us to use to make certain that uh, you know we used to if, if you say your traditional terms might be net 30 days you might not start contacting somebody till it's 36 37 days and and you're probably okay but uh, in this environment uh, we went to you know pardon the pun, but we went to lockdown. And if somebody hit 30 days, they weren't going, we weren't going to ship something until all payments were current. And I think that that's, uh, that we're, we certainly weren't the only people that, uh, that made those types of actions. The other things that in sometimes a, a pandemic or in a, a situation like this exposes is that although you think that you have all the controls in process, you know, you have people who uh, you, maybe you offer discounted terms to a uh, to a customer, and those those terms might be one ten net thirty or something along those lines. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, they're paying you in seventeen nineteen days, but still taking taking the discount. And I think that's an opportunity that uh, that our accounting department uh, really was able to flag as to you know who was taking unearned discounts and what, what are we able to do to, to get back and, and, and to recover uh, those types of uh, those types of money. So lots, lots there. Those are just two examples of things that, uh, that we've gone through uh, and from an inventory standpoint to the, to specifically to the question about inventory uh, 
there's no way you can predict what your volume's going to be. I mean, you know, uh, it's just, it was just totally unpredictable. Uh, we, we took an approach that uh, uh, we cut our inventory in half and managed our, our customers to half. And we thought that uh, we had to pick a number and, you know, we had some that were 30 and some that were 40 and some that were 60. And, you know, in general, it was about a half that we had to go to uh, because, again, we did not want to have cash tied up in inventory that was just going to sit there. And nobody knew when this started how long it was going to sit. Sure. sure. So you're, you're talking about a couple of other things, you know, inventory rationing, uh, marketing customer segmentation, uh, and, and perhaps, again, from a marketing perspective, um, modifying service level agreements for uh, different strat- stratifications of customer groups uh, during this, this, this rationed time, mm-hmm. which could also apply on, on the supply, on the supply base facing side of the supply chain, as Jackie alluded to earlier with regard to risk uh, and shoring up those supply sources to ensure you don't have a stoppage due to a component, a $2 or 10 cent component that uh, uh, you're short on, right? To shut down your entire line, absolutely. Um, Zora, I'd like you to weigh in from this, from the standpoint of uh, investment in those looking to upskill or cross-train from one job into, say, one type of frontline manufacturing job or supply chain job to another. I would imagine the workforce development issues are, are front and center. Sure. So I will also comment a little bit on the previous question, Go although this is far afield from the question, it's closer to the answer. You know, if you think about the challenge that higher education leaders face right now, um, they most have an unknown demand. Most have very little good information about student behavior in the fall. Uh, You know, the needle is still bouncing. You hear everything from we plan to be up slightly to we plan to be down 20%. And so if you think about what that means from a planning perspective um, in terms of the overall, you know, how much of everything you need to buy, (laughs) you see the tremendous challenge that leaders face. Uh, You know, in terms of workforce development, obviously, this is a huge, huge moment for for that part of our work. Um, As I said earlier, we continue to have um, all-time historic highs of people who are unemployed um, and people who are um, maybe being called back to work and maybe, uh, you know, don't have the luxury of weighing the pros and cons of returning, but don't feel particularly safe doing so. And so people in the service sector are a good example of that. Uh, And so we're using this moment as an opportunity to reach out to everyone who's received unemployment insurance benefits, who's receiving SNAP, which is the new food stamps, um, to let them know that the state of Missouri has money available for training. In many cases, it's available in pretty short-term chunks, and it's all online. So we have uh, activated a reverse call center and a pretty um, aggressive marketing campaign to get the word out to people that, uh, you know, better jobs are available uh, with the investment of a little bit of time. Okay. Jackie, any comments or thoughts you'd like to add? No, I think, I mean, when Byron was asking about, I think it's too early in the equation to be kind of taking a look at any data, but I do think, you know, um, uh, you know, um, companies from when they, you know, um, their raw materials are costing them more, so short-term um, responses that they're passing those price increases, um, on um, to their customers and, um, you know, and that, that, you know, the long-term impact of that, and we'll see how that, you know, kind of shakes out um, and um, as things go forward. You know, I also think that, um, you know, the basic theory behind just-in-time um, inventory management may change um, just based upon, um, you know, that cautionary, you know, things can happen. And, um, and maybe, um, you, you, know, you, you know, in a pandemic one time, you might be able to ration inventory and, um, and customers will accept that. But longer term, um, you know, reactions to that and, and ability to keep customers um, in the longer term, um, you know, they may not have um, the, um, you know, the, the willingness um, to sustain. Absolutely. The whole question is, have we become too lean in our American supply chains, right? And uh, for the, at, this, at the risk of having a faster RO, our return on asset base, uh, we've, we've, we've leaned out the supply chain and pushed those products and those, those component supplies further upstream, uh, downstream, I'm sorry, upstream back towards our suppliers. Um, so lots of questions there that we could spend an entire hour on, but we don't have that time uh, today. We've got another question in uh, from Wayne. Uh, This is directed at Scott. Uh, How have you seen the sales reps from your suppliers change how they have dealt with your team? 
And then how has your sales team responded to the changes and challenges that uh, you have mentioned uh, in their dealings with your customers? So Anthony, thanks for the question. And uh, I think that uh, I, I would start by sales, saying salespeople uh, by their very nature are, are people who enjoy the interactive uh, with their customers. And so it's become you know, difficult for you know, salespeople not to be able to make sales calls on, uh, on the buyers and, uh, and, and to have to do things all via telephone and, uh, and uh, video conference uh, to, to stay in touch. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, by and large, uh, the sales groups have, uh, have done a pretty good job of, uh, of doing exactly that. I think where the, the sales jobs have, uh, have changed the most is that they have had to become uh, more involved with different elements or different details of the business as opposed to just selling and generating revenue. I think that, uh, you know, normally they're responsible for generating revenue, generating profit, and, and, and managing business relationships. And now all of a sudden they have to get involved in uh, giving descriptions as to why inventory is having to be allocated and why, even though you're not in a force majeure situation, we have to be fair to all of our customers and why we have to say no to a customer that wasn't with us before that, that says all of a sudden they want to become your customer. And now we have to communicate but we really need to be taking care of those who've been with us all along. We want your business and we'll help as best we can, but we have to, we have to help those that have helped us as, as we go through. So I, I think that they, they have to get involved. Our salespeople have to get involved in much more difficult conversations with customers about the details of the business, as opposed to just the, the financial elements of, of, uh, of the supply and the, the pricing and things along those lines. Okay, good. I, I think if I may summarize that, what I heard you summarize uh, an overview in response to that question are things around uh, the, the increasing importance, uh, more so today, with customer relationship management. Uh, and as Jackie pointed out, the increasing importance of um, supplier relationship management uh, from a risk mitigation or risk management perspective. And also, as both you and Zora have, have pointed out, uh, is the whole idea of talent pool and relationships uh, with talent pool sources, whether they be universities, small to medium-sized firms, um, and also the role of state government in actually helping to maintain an, uh, a prepared workforce, uh, whether it's in supply chain or some other discipline. How do we, you know, prepare for a recovery, let's say a year from now, assuming there is a recovery a year from now, to be ready to support the small to medium sized enterprises across our state with talent pools. Uh, and, and also how do companies uh, think about partnering with uh, universities in their own backyard uh, from, a stand, from a standpoint of designing, as Zora mentioned, uh, micro credentialing and certificates uh, that help not only four year college graduates, but also two year program graduates and tech school graduates come up to speed and be able to transition from one career trajectory to another with a, in a little less time, right? Companies won't have two or three years to wait, right? So are there opportunities, right? And that's part of my, my closing question to you. Where do we see supply chain going, supply chain management as a profession going in our state moving forward? And I'm asking you to prognosticate, yes. <laughs> and just as the weather, weather forecasters are, they're only 10% correct. And we may be uh, looking back a year from now and saying, well, we were one-tenth correct. So if you can close us out with your thoughts on where do you think we might be a year from now? And let's start with Jackie. Sure. I, I mean, I think that there, um, you know, there definitely is opportunity. I think what we have to be able to do is articulate what a career in supply chain management um, involves, because I think, you know, even if you ask any professional what supply chain management, you'll probably get half a dozen or more different responses from logistics to purchasing to, um, you know, the, the different um, functional areas that Scott highlighted within his company um, are um, composed there. So I think, you know, there definitely is um, opportunity 
Um, it is a profession um, that is increasingly important and um, provides a competitive advantage to companies. And so I think from a, you know, I, but I think we have to be able to like, you know, we have to be able to do a good sales job. We have to be able to clearly articulate um, and, um, you know, the interesting components and the challenges um, and the opportunities that exist within that, um, that career field. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Um, Zora, you want to jump in and then we'll finish off with Scott? Sure. Uh, you know, I think, I think a lot of things have changed and will continue to change. Um, you know, a colleague of mine said that in higher education, traditionally prestige has been the coin of the realm, but increasingly it will be trust. And so, you know, when I think about if I was a parent or a student or a displaced worker, what I would want to know is, is this thing that I'm investing my time and money in going to be there in two years or three years? Will it survive COVID-19 or a hurricane or global warming or whatever the next big disruption is? Um, and so when I think about, you know, how to communicate with people about the value of a, of a career in supply chain, I do think that durability um, is a big part of it. And the fact that regardless of what happens next, this is only going to be an increasingly important uh, study. Professional durability. Great point. Great point. All right, Scott. I think that uh, one thing I would say for certain is, is we have a, uh, a new crop of uh, supply chain professionals that uh, have uh, learned to manage through a pandemic. And uh, many times as we're trying to, to, to bring uh, people into our supply chain, they, they want to know how, how can we train them for something that's unpredicted. And we continuously say whether it's a flood, whether it's a fire, whether it is a pandemic, that you really have to live through it to understand because each of those is different. And uh, I think that uh, Jackie had some really good comments in the, the way that uh, one of the insurance factors that, uh, that we all uh, probably will, will become better at is having a diversity of suppliers uh, so we're not as dependent upon one because if they happen to uh, not make it through uh, whatever the crisis is of the moment, uh, that's going to put you in a really bad situation. So I don't know that uh, I don't know that uh, ten years from now I will tell you that supply chain will be uh, more reliant upon big data and that uh, the pressure to drive cost out will continue. That's not going to change. And, you know, while we may think that uh, we're, we're lean and uh, as, about as lean as we can get, uh, there's still going to be a continued uh, pressure to, to, to focus on cost and to, to make supply chain cost be as minimal part of your system as possible. Absolutely. So as our, our two questions posed to us have, have highlighted to us, the journey continues. <laughs> and is never instinct, and never ending. All right, I wanna thank our panelists, um, Commissioner Mulligan, uh, Scott Stuckenschneider, and Jackie Vasquez for joining us on our inaugural edition of the Business Insider. Uh, and I now uh, wish you all the best, and feel free to follow up with us uh, at the university uh, here in Columbia by contacting our deans, uh, team, our deans, Dean Ajay Vinze's team, as the need may, may be. And uh, we welcome any follow-on questions uh, at the end of this sem seminar. So thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>